Welcome to the post recording for week two of services marketing. So a couple of things, the class voted and the recap was equal to the preview. So course videos will be released as they are prepared, as they are ready and no strictly uh, fixed schedule will be applied because Half the place wants it as a recap and half the place wants it as a preview. So it will entirely depend on what the week looks like in terms of when it's most useful to release. Session objectives, uh, content objectives for this recap video. Uh, we want to be able to look at the four pillars of services marketing. This conceptual framework of intangibility, heterogeneity, inseparability and perishability is a central platform for the subject and we will be revisiting these concepts time and time again as we go through the semester because they have a recurring influence over the way in which we're going to modify good space marketing to work with services. In the lecture, there was a discussion around the assessment task items and some modifications as to how to uh, recast and refit the assessment tasks to be most useful for you. And the first refit has been released with the assessment task one and the second and third refits are underway. Now in the lectures we do the last week recap, so whenever this is a recap slide deck you will see the last week recap. If it's a preview slide deck, I won't have this because I won't have the information. That will be my unknown unknowns. And my known unknown, I know I don't know what you don't know. So, a couple of things that came up. Uh, the size of the font indicates the frequency with which the idea uh, was repeated in the the data gathering. Data gathering was people wrote things down on yellow sticky notes and 3M notes and stuck them on the board. Things we know, things people feel confident around are the seduction model, co-creation value, and strangely enough, the things that people know that they don't know are the seduction model. And should we head down into the unknown unknown, we see the seduction model and the unknown unknown. So the unknown unknown and the unknown unknown, we'll see the seduction model. So thus far the course is tracking as I would have expected. Seduction is important and it's okay to be confused, it's okay to be confident, either way works for you. Uh, but basically the idea is we are going to Go a couple more weeks on the seduction model, and if required, more material will be reintroduced into the course, an additional explainer. Now, what I also asked people to do on the seduction field tests uh, last week was to go and check in with the classes and the classroom environments that people were in. The end result of that was a quite good discussion about how the learning space in the Murray Ray, even between subjects, was quite different in the, how I was using it and how other subjects were using it. Also how the smaller, narrower lecture theatres really don't loan themselves to group dynamic. So this is a good, this is one of the things about the services marketing theories and ideas is getting used to the idea, or getting used to the approach of Here's a theory. Theories describe services. I mean a bunch of services. I mean all the subjects I mean are services. How's this theory working in this subject? How's this theory working in the other subjects? So learning outcomes for this deck is to talk through the four pillars and also I want to get you to look at seduction and uh, the Four pillars as what's the interaction effect? How do these things potentially connect with each other? Because these theories are all interconnected and the whole thing is cyclical and loops around, it's always important when you pick up a new piece of information to go, 
how does this fit against what I know already in this subject? So from the top, let's see what we got. So the first thing that uh, I want to kind of counter a little bit that the textbook talks about sort of services, and I'm prone to doing this as well, talking about services emerging in uh, the 1980s. Services has been a core part of the definition of marketing in the AMA since 1935. The AMA was formed in 1935. So in 35, marketing was all about the flow of goods and services. In 85, it was all about ideas, goods and services. In 2004, it becomes value. 2007, it becomes offerings that have value. So basically, it's, it's staggering up from two distinct classes to three distinct classes to the overall everything's hybrid approach. But it's been present since the origin of marketing. So this isn't suddenly a quick, uh, it's the 1980s, let's develop services marketing. So in this argument, and you will see authors arguing that about basically the death of the IHIP model. You'll see uh, in the service dominant logic domain, the Vargo and Luce papers saying that these are arbitrary uh, because the notion of services should be more like goods. Therefore, intangibility is the lack of service being a good. Inseparability is the lack of a service being a good. That's their argument. For us, though, these are, and the approach that we're taking the subject, intangibility is a factor. It's neither a bug nor a feature. It's a factor. When you are performing service, there is a lack of... It's not the objects that are the dominant reason the service is being performed. You're not going to a service for its physical objects per se, you're going to a service for the intangible, the experiential, for the skills application, for a series of reasons that put the physicality of the service into second or third place. So consequently, you need to factor that in. Most services are delivered and consumed at the same point. So the idea that your customer and your consumer, so customers and consumers, sticking with the AMA 2007 de definition, customer and client, when you create a service, the service is going to take place at the point in which the customer is present for a lot of services. So inseparability is this facet that if the customer isn't present, the service can't take place. Now, goods dominant, goods dominant logic that Vargo and Lush created, to go with service dominant logic, the idea is that the, in service dominant logic, the co-creation of value says that uh, an object must be present for value to be performed. So... As far as they're concerned, inseparability applies to everything. So if you are doing this as this video, uh, the inseparability argument really is services are sold then produced. Now, this video is produced independently of your consumption. But if we reverse that to the services marketing lecture, um, the services marketing seminar where your presence is required for the seminar to take place, then simultaneous production consumption. Under the service dominant logic that you are listening to this video and you are co-present at the point of the video means that inseparability is applied, which it's a fair argument that the consumption of value requires um, inseparability. So therefore that's probably not a unique facet. But the flip side is I can create and stockpile videos for your consumption 
that I have produced independently of your presence. And in the weekly briefing videos, all of these videos were produced prior to people enrolling in the subject. So I was able to stockpile a service through digitization and minimize the inseparability. So it's not a perfect, it's not 100% oh it's inseparable therefore service, but at the same time it's a, when it's a physical environment, when it's a live face-to-face, -face, the service is produced in the presence of the consumer, therefore we can embrace it and do customization, or we can reject it and try for standardization. Heterogeneity, uh, the variability in performance by the service provider, and the variability in the consumption by the service customer. When we get into consumer behavior, this is going to be a really important facet of services marketing. Because the consumer takes on a greater responsibility for the co-production of their value offer, their variance, their variability, will determine a lot of the service quality. Take for instance, going to, you know, you get a membership at the uh, gym that's on campus, just down by the Murray Ray. If you go in there early in the week, when you're pretty fired up, pretty, uh, you, you still got a fairly high energy level, versus you go in there after class, versus you go in there on uh, late in the week after a heavy week, your physical, your ability to physically do various tasks in the gym, like how much weight you can lift, how long you can last on the treadmill, how well you can swim, all of these are going to be impacted by your own personal condition. The longer you go to a gym, the more that you require the your improvement in consumption, co-production performance, means that you require a more complicated service because you're better at the existing service. Now, if we compare uh, this for something like a, you go to a restaurant, there is that moment of the heterogeneity where the consumption by the service provider is important. So if you're using fresh uh, produce, that will vary. So variability still exists in physical goods. But the variability in consumption by the service consumer is also important because there's the difference between the delight mode of you've just been surprised by how good something is and the expectation mode of you remember what it was like last time so you want to be that good or better next time. So there are some things around heterogeneity of performance by customers. There are things by heterogeneity of performance by providers. Again, these are questions of do we embrace it and look for heavily customized, highly variable, you're not quite sure what you're going to get twice in a row type experiences, or do we go out of our way to minimize that sort of uh, variance in experience and try and create consistency by provider because we cannot create consistency by customer. Now, the last aspect, perishability, is the idea that you can't store a or stockpile a service. With digitization, we are able to do self-service based technology, which can negate or minimize some of the perishability. Supply and demand management become quite critical when we are looking at uh, creating you know, anywhere on campus one of the biggest aspects of perishability in this at the ANU is the parking. You cannot go back to last Tuesday to when there was a spare parking spot and use it. So we can have a big stockpile of parking and on the weekends it's not doing anything. Similarly, we can have a whole lot of service capacity. If you walk past a restaurant with many empty tables and many empty chairs, you are there's plenty of supply, but there's not a lot of demand. And quite often, particularly around uh, aspects such as nightclubs, if there isn't a queue out the door, how do you know if it's good? So perishability, uh, access 
time sensitivity. These are facets that you can, again, it's all about to embrace or reject. So for me, in engaging with the, the four pillars, it comes down to strategic and tactical decisions. Do you want to embrace what that facet of the product represents? Or do you want to mitigate it? It will be a strategic decision that is context sensitive. There is no clean, consistent, you must always embrace, you must always reject. There is a, it needs to be based on evidence and argument. And you need to make a conscious strategic decision of this is what I want to do and why. So as we go through, I'm going to talk to some of the aspects. Uh, the textbook, and in fairness, uh, I have picked this up from Vargo and Lush. The textbooks in services marketing quite often try to make services more goods-like. We are very efficient in our dealings in goods-based uh, marketing because we've got a lot more practice in making physical objects and making those objects consistently and doing supply chains and big manufacturing plants and dealing with all the scalability issues that come with uh, producing 10,000 objects. So there is a predisposition to lean towards the mitigation. I come from a background where embracing and working with the, the challenges I see that as a feature, and features are always worth exploring. So let's take intangibility for a second. If we look at the challenges, you lack inventory, you lack patents, it's difficult to display the attributes of a service, and it's challenging to price them. So a mitigation strategy would be to find ways to mechanize or digitize the product. For instance, this video. Services marketing, the subject, doesn't have an inventory. You can't go down to the library and check out two hours of services lecture. On the other hand, by the use of pre and post recorded videos, you can access a service product, the digital service product, and that can make up, I can create an inventory of services lecture, lectures. So digitization and mechanization allows for inventory to be created. That's taking a goods-based solution. Services can't be tangibilized. There's no inventory. Make it more like a good, in, create an inventory, solve a problem. On the other side, since services are experiential, and we don't have physical goods, I can use that aspect of the intangibility to deliver a service anywhere. Anywhere that I am present, I can take my services skill-based and deliver my service. So it cuts down on my distribution costs. It cuts down a lot of my, I don't have warehousing costs, so I can have a greater profit margin where I'm not needing physical objects. A lack of inventory also means that I can quickly update my service. If I have embedded my service into physical objects and something changes in terms of pricing, trends in the market, uh, one of the most amazing examples of this on the physical goods market was a tablet, computer tablet manufacturer released their product on the Monday. It was for $1,000 on the Monday. By Friday, it was at $50 and being sold out because they decided they didn't want to compete in the market anymore. Change of management. They sh shedded their inventory, took huge financial losses, burnt a lot of goodwill. Now, if you're a service provider and on the Monday you are offering a service in management consulting, and on the Tuesday, a new product is released. Uh, you know, 
a new concept is released. So someone comes up, uh, puts out a huge study saying that the seven habits of highly successful people has no statistical, methodological, or social validity. And on the Monday, you were a coach of the seven habits of highly successful people. On the Wednesday, you can be coaching something else entirely. Five parachutes, cheese movement, whatever it is, you can change because you don't have an inventory that you then have to sell off and work through. The lack of inventory is a feature. It allows for flexibility. It allows for adaptiveness. It allows for movement of the service provider. It allows for conversion of the service into different alternatives, different platforms, as long as you embrace it. Same way for the difficulty to display attributes actually pairs with the lack of patents. A service cannot be, a service is difficult to patent. I can't say for certain anymore that can't be patented, but it's difficult to patent a service because patents are built around physical objects. So obviously, People can experience a service, then copy the service. In fact, one of the biggest challenges services marketing faces in this aspect is the consumer can go to a service, experience it, and then figure out if they can do it themselves as a self-service. But because it's difficult to display the attributes, it's difficult to fully copy a service. And many times people have gone to try to rip off their opponents and copy their opponents and it's the personal skill of the service provider that can't be displayed, can't be patented but isn't displayed that makes the difference. Now the pro side to difficulty to display attributes again is flexibility, the ability to change product offerings easily so customization becomes a real strength. With customization being a strong asset that allows for greater co-creation, greater value creation. The downside is that it's harder to advertise. And because it's harder to advertise, it's harder to communicate. And quite often you have to do things such as trials, demonstrations, or rely on word of mouth. And this is where the proxy traits come in of people explaining their experience to other people rather than looking at your product I won't say objectively, but looking at the object of your product. So it's a lot easier to see an Xbox as a bunch of plastic and controllers, whereas trying to explain why Fortnite is so important versus to a generation of people who grew up playing single-player Doom and single-player Quake, multiplayer games uh, lack the inventory, lack the attributes, difficult to explain, rely on word of mouth. But this is also why we've had the rise of a whole marketplace of people on YouTube who do the word of mouth, who do the experiential, who do provide that particular information set to their listening audience. So, inseparability. Now, the first thing I'm gonna say about the four pillars is that they are not actually four standalone they're four uh, overlapping. So they are a Venn diagram. There is a huge area of overlap between each aspect because when it's intangible, you can't stockpile it. And since you can't stockpile it, you can't ship it. Since you can't ship it, you can't have distribution separated from consumption. Hence, inseparability. So, a couple of the things that... Uh, cross-related interconnected concepts here. The service provider becomes a physical part of the service. So the person who provides the service to you takes on the role of being part of the product and they're a proxy measure for the product. We deal with this in greater depth in a couple of the later chapters, particularly when we start looking at the extended services marketing mix where People physical, pros, people, physical evidence and processes become important. Here, inseparability is also about the interpersonal connection. Because the service provider is connected to the service, 
that is a point of advantage and that's why whilst you can't patent you can retain your service provider so if you are creating an environment where you keep your high quality staff and there are interpersonal skills their strong interpersonal dynamic with their customers where you are looking at your clients having their marketing relationship uh, their loyalty and their service preference to one of your staff members you don't need to patent the service you need to protect the ongoing employment of that staff member so this is where we look at different facets of again embrace or uh, embrace or mitigate so with inseparability the other aspect to this that's really important to consider is we are really looking at the idea that you can't have the service or at its highest form the customer and the service provider must be present for the service to exist so if you are getting legal advice your lawyer should be in the room or on the teleconference or on the phone if you're getting dental work done you don't have a huge amount of choice other than to have the dentist with you. You can't remote, you can't telemedicine dental work. That'd be one hell of a 3D printer we'd develop to do that. But base then your considerations on the extent to which the personal skill level of the staff member becomes a central and important part of how the service exists, how the service works, and if we're embracing inseparability, then what we're looking for is higher levels of skill-based services where the intangibility is a feature, the customization is a feature, the skill of the employee is a feature, and that allows us to price higher, provide unique service experiences because our employee can work with the customer to get the outcome, because they've got the skills to deliver, and that gives us a market advantage. Alternatively, we can try and reject the inseparability and create things like the digital product packages. Now, the second part of the inseparability is where we get a massive crossover with the modern thinking and the contemporary 2004, 2008 plus surface dominant logic. If you Look at this from the perspective of embracing. The customers must be involved in the production process so the customers become partial employees of the firm. We are providing, and in services marketing, the subject, this is a key part. You are involved in the production of the subject, both in terms of your own self-service activity, these videos, the readings, the assessment tasks, but also your role in the classroom as customer and other customers. You are in group work supporting the people around you, the people around you are supporting you. We're creating, we're using your presence inside the production process to enhance the overall experience. Now there's also the ability to step back and look at the level of involvement. Now, big asterisk here, this is not the consumer behavior definition of involvement. Uh, this is the presence. So if you think about it as customer presence, the customer may be present from start to finish. Dental work, massage, medical services. They may be present to start and stop the service. Mechanic, you drop your car off, you come back and get it later. The skills are applied to the object you own you only need to be there to commence the service and to stop the service. You only need to be mentally or remotely present. Uh, any online video game service, uh, all of the self-service based technologies, uh, that all digital services, you can be remotely present. You only need to be engaging the service. You don't need to be present at the point of production. But you do need to be, and this is where service dominant logic also kicks in, the customer needs to be involved at the point of consumption. So the involvement, the customer's involvement at the point of consumption is a, 
it's an area that said service dominant logic's picked up on, um, so it's worth looking into what they're doing, but to embrace it. The customer is the star of the show, the customer is facilitated through the environment, the employees work to create a, an experience with rather than for. Step it back one, the customer may be partially present throughout the service, you create an experience for. So if you're going to, if you consider the difference between an escape room and a cinema, and a play and a, an improv comedy show. An improvised comedy show, the audience is required to assist the production of the process by periodically providing suggestions, Heckling is not only welcome, it is encouraged. If you go to a theatre performance where callbacks are part of the show, that audience engagement is necessary for the service to reach its full potential. Roll that through to something like the, uh, the theatre where you are present in the audience, you are there to witness, but you are not there to interact. It's still a service, it just have a different level of customer presence. Now, the embrace reject option here is to start looking then at how does the customer have an impact on the type of service, the length of service, and the demand. Do we need to bring the customer to us? Do we need to go to the customer? On the customer to us mode, we set up the restaurant. So if you walk through the north quarter of the Canberra Centre, you will see they're currently rebooting another round of the restaurants. The physical environment of the restaurant being developed as a, an attraction, a draw, we're trying to take the customer to the service. If we then look at something like the Foodora or the Uber Eats, the service factories can be built with separation. We then ask the question, what actually is the service? Is it the food or the delivery? And that we've got a, a multiple bundle of service product taking place there. But there's no need for the customer to be co-present for the, at the service factory for the food manufacturing. A number of, uh, number of restaurants and food outlets have built basically commercial delivery kitchens. They are functionally the same back end of the restaurant, but they have taken out the front end. There's no, there's no seating, there's just a waiting zone for the delivery drivers to pick up the supplies. So they've separated demand, they've separated production, they've uh, mitigated inseparability. Flip that to the high-end restaurants that have the chef's table, inside the kitchen so you can witness what's going on backstage and that's the most expensive seat in the house and that takes quite a degree of getting to to get access to that's embracing the inseparability so again you want to be looking at this from is this a bug is this a feature can we sell it can we use it now the other aspect of the inseparability that's super important here is the presence of the service provider and the customer is consideration number one. Is it a one-on-one -on -one service? If it's a one-on-many service, for example, we go back to the improv comedy show. Is it a one-on-many service? Yes, it is. One set of providers on the stage, too many in the audience. The interaction that the audience have with each other will also determine the degree of success that the service providers have overall. So if you've gone to a comedy show to watch the comedian and everyone around you is heckling them so you never actually get to hear the comedian's act, you just get to hear the comedian interacting with the three people either side of you, that could be the best service experience of your life. It could be the worst. So there is that question. What is the role of the other customer in providing the service experience. Uh, 
I think if we look at something like you go down to see the Canberra Raiders play, if you're part of the Raider Army and you're down there uh, in your cosplay outfit of uh, your jersey and your face paint, and sports fans are the best cosplayers on the planet. They're great. You're wearing your, uh, you're wearing your sports fandom uniform to the event, and you and your other sports fandom friends are sitting together and you're chanting and you know the words, the cheers, the customers, in, the inseparability, the presence of other customers is a huge positive factor. So we want to look at this again as a, do we embrace it? Do we isolate it? Sometimes you want to run the event without the uh, presence of other fans. This is where we create private boxes at the opera. This is where we have corporate boxes down at uh, the Raider Stadium. This is where we run exclusivity as a market segment with a different need. You want to be present at the production, you just don't want to be present with the other customers. So there are ways and means to embrace it and mitigate inseparability, in part driven by your market segmentation strategy. So segmentation, targeting, positioning become really useful aspects for deciding how do we mitigate or how do we embrace. Third up, heterogeneity. This is also frequently referred to as inconsistency. And it's one of my favorite in-jokes in marketing is that we call heterogeneity inconsistency and we do it interchangeably deliberately. Because heterogeneity is the fact that things aren't consistent. So calling it inconsistency means that you are dealing with variations. You're dealing with variants that, when you've got a machine involved, the machine should be pretty accurate. And most, I mean, most machines are designed to be accurate. There is some work that's being put into now uh, around the use of randomization functions, um, a little bit of sort of machine learning to create variants. But at the end of the run, a human employee will have variants. There will be variability. This is in part because you're going to see variability in the condition of your staff member. So if you have a good day, and you've had the experience, you've gone to work and it has been sunshine and roses. Nothing can darken the day. You are walking around, there's a sunbeam permanently shining on you and you are this relentless wall of enthusiasm. You are the walking embodiment of the good day and on that day, your service delivery can be quite significantly different from what it is when you're coming tired, you're starting to get a cold, it's just been, you've walked to work and it's been freezing outside, you get in there, you haven't defrosted yet, you're just not ready for humans, and you're on stage trying to sell things to people, it's your bad day, it's not going well. So within the same employee, there will be variation. There will also be variation because we use, if we are using non-scripted service delivery, Variation is a feature. Variation is a good thing. And that's the other thing. I believe that we should be embracing the heterogeneity and the variation because services are human-led, adaptable, variable, and if we use that facet, we use the variation, we get to make the best use of having humans. Computers are very good at doing the same things multiple times and many times in a row. Humans are very good at problem solving creativity. Work to strength. This goes for you as well, Amazon. Stop trying to make people into robots. Have, embrace the capacity. So the quality control question is obviously an important one. What do we do in terms of trying to minimize variation in employees? Uh, we have a whole section around role scripts, service role. Uh, you can tell how heavily scripted someone is by the fact that they work for the same organization. The scripts are embedded into them. 
If you switch between multiple service providers, you'll find that your response script that you didn't realize you'd been taught will clash with their production strip, script. Case in point, McDonald's and KFC, when you order food and the food is delivered. For the longest time, KFC handed you your objects directly. If you bought one thing, say a large chips, large fries, they would hand the object to you directly. At the McDonald's, they put it on the counter and slide it across the counter to you. If you've been routinely buying from KFC, you will hold your hand out at the wrong height for the McDonald's product. At the same time, if you go to from McDonald's to KFC, you will be your hand will be waiting on the counter to receive the products, receive your food being pushed to you, and they will be holding it uh, somewhere between chin and torso for you. Your going to be in the wrong point for the script. They will then have to... I have accidentally uh, done this early in my services marketing career, ended up making some poor KFC employee practically do a sine wave as I, both of us tried to flip our response scripts and counter to each other. Eventually I got the food, but on the way through, I was clearly breaking a script and a standardization script and I was trying to not, I was trying to adapt to their requirements as they were going, oh, customer, customer's always right. I'll change to your requirements. So standardization can have a massive, massive problem in that sense. On the other side, standardization can be an absolute core of your service delivery. If you are doing something like the, and we'll take one of the big ticket operations, Disneyland has standardized scripts. The theme park, you go into that ride four times in a row and the actors playing the characters will give you the same script. And they will deliver it with the same level of, this is the first time you've ever seen it, this is the most important thing that they're gonna to do today is give you this service delivery. And that is the strength of of standardization. It doesn't require, it reduces cognitive load. You can get people to deliver without having them to, without needing them to recreate, improvise, or redevelop each time. And this is a strength. This is what standardization does really well. So we can embrace it. We can embrace standardization to form the core. which means that you are in fact mitigating heterogeneity. Embracing heterogeneity is when it goes down to customization. Accepting that you're going to have your variants in your staff, giving your staff role freedom, when they know that they're not up to the role, it's like <coughs> take a backstage versus a front stage, depending on your energy levels or your ability to people embrace the heterogeneity by giving your employees the capacity to solve the problem the customer has to meet the needs of the customer rather than having to run the customer through a standardized checklist. So the challenges to heter caused by heterogeneity, the biggest one is the inconsistency. Inconsistency makes service expectation difficult, service expectation makes communication of services difficult, which creates problems around promotion, but also heterogeneity creates problems around the establishment of the back-end invisible processes. So heterogeneity and customization here do impact back on the subduction model because if you're going with a customization strategy, it can limit your ability to create economies of scale and to create standardization processes in the back end of your service. Again, this can be a pro, this can be a con, but the key is it needs to be a strategic decision. You need to have decided that yes, we're going to embrace it, therefore our systems are flexible. So customer, the customization strategy, variance is important. 
the variance also requires a larger infrastructure to support it. Something as basic as a coffee shop. So if we take the, uh, the cafe that's at the bottom of the ANU CBE 26 building, if they want to go with a standardization, it will minimize the number of products they put on offer. It will speed up the production process and it may not meet the market needs, but if the preference is for fast rather than variable, it can be the, the value offer that the customer is looking for. So if your plan is to just grab a coffee, thanks, between classes, so you've just left the lecture theater, you're on the way to the tutorial room, you just want a coffee, you don't want to have to call code, you don't have to write code to get your coffee to come out. Standardization strategy, speed. If, however, they decide that they're going to embrace customization because we've got a highly variable marketplace, a lot of um, different customer needs and wants, and they want to improve the extent to which they can reach and meet those needs, then the variation strategy requires a greater infrastructure. Even something as basic as if you are going to offer a coffee with milk, if you're going to put soy milk, almond milk, cow milk, low-fat cow milk, whatever new milk that they're making out of the milk printing farms, uh, another vegetable-based milk, there, coconut milk. I'm you now just making milk up at this point in time. Uh, five different product options. You've just increased your customization capacity, but you've also just increased what you need to provide in terms of your backstage systems. Your systems now need to have five items in the inventory rather than one. This should, customization should take advantage then of variation inherent and your customers should then be able to be, you should be able to reach more customers because you can do variations. Now if we take, again move back up the chain here from a customization strategy works really well when you embrace the intangibility. Heterogeneity and intangibility go together really well because the more physical objects you bring into the services marketing experience, the more likely it is that you are going to end up with a standardized because it's going to be pick an option from the menu of physical objects that you're going to interact with. This, again, has its advantages. Its disadvantage is that if you want to go with a very heavy customization strategy and you have a lot of physical objects, you're getting into goods-based problems of inventories, perishability of the objects, uh, access and variance, economies of scale. Ultimately, though, the easiest customization comes from when a product is in inherently intangible and embrace for its intangibility because the service provider then becomes the point of customization. Your skills can be varied, your use of your skills, how you solve a problem can be varied and embraced more easily if it's a purely intangible service. So advice and uh, you come to a student consultation session you listen to this video versus coming to a student consultation session, the video gives you some standard eyes. This is now going to be the same every time you play it back. Should I re-record this video, it will not be the same. I will not be able to do the same script twice. I'm not working to a script. Uh, so there is those aspects of the replay will be consistent. Come see me in a consultation time with a problem you need solved. You're looking for inconsistency. You don't want me to be repeating from a pre-established uh, framework. You want me to be solving the problem that you've presented. So you want the heterogeneity. You want the customization. Coming around, perishability. This is the last one in the deck. And this is the interesting one from... This is logistics. Straight up. 
Perishability is now supply and demand writ large. If you didn't think much of that bit of um, econometrics, sorry, it's back. But here we're much more interested in the tactical elements and the tactical problems that perishability creates and the tactical opportunities. So first and foremost, perishability is the concept that services by their intangible nature and by their inseparable nature and by their inconsistent nature can't be stockpiled, inventoried, and you can't go back and reaccess them. So you can have a stockpile of physical objects. So a manufacturer can run a million units of, uh, they can make a million t-shirts. Until they sell those out, they've got a stockpile of t-shirts. The same manufacturer, if they were holding a live t-shirt making day, has only got the capacity for that day to be experienced on the day, its ability, and as many people as they could fit into their production facilities, its ability. So perishability is going to be about getting the right number of people into your service at the point in time that you are offering the service and dealing with a few, dealing and embracing with uh, the elements around it. So one of the big aspects of perishability that uh, comes in uh, quite a lot is that we try and shift demand. And we're used to seeing demand shifting in, in aspects such as price incentives. So running, working out when is the service not in high demand and I do love the fact that Tuesdays were the low demand days, and then it became two for Tuesdays. So Tuesday then sort of acquired a tradition of being the discounting, the day of discounting. So we brought the demand, but we kind of peaked the demand on Tuesdays now, and the whole reason that came into existence in the first place was the data said nobody's coming to our service. We can see this when we start seeing things like Friday afternoon happy hours. That's a pricing incentive. We're trying to do some demand drives. We can reject perishability by trying to uh, tangibilize the product, separate the product, create it in terms of uh, create that separation between production and consumption. Or we can embrace it by going and deciding that we're going to make the service experience limited edition or limited capacity. Reservation systems and ticketing, I've used that on a class before now. Um, Eventbrite. Now, the idea here is that you want to reduce the risk for the customer. You're also creating a value. When something has a finite number, so you've got a ticketing scheme, and the ticketing scheme says one of 200. Then you know that you are going to be part of a limited number of people who access this particular thing. Scarcity creates value. Value is communicated here in terms of the, you are part of an exclusive. You have guaranteed your access. So you've got a ticket, you can definitely uh, access the event. If you, and we'll see this uh, events, uh, Disney uses this with the ride pass, a lot of theme parks use exclusive, an exclusivity ticket for a reservation system so that they reduce queuing time, uh, VIP memberships, gold passes, business passes, uh, Qantas Club, Platinum Club. These are all perishability problems using reservation and uh, exclusivity systems to reduce risk, guarantee access to space, and reduce wait time. The mechanism here is also a case of perishability is being mitigated. A reservation system reduces your risk of the service perishing before you can access it. We can flip that over to increase risk so that we increase queuing time so that we create a social phenomenon. Fiscally and physical goods, we're seeing this a lot around things like 
the releases of the new models of iPhones where people camp out for an extended period of time, uh, camping out for exclusive access to the, you know, the first screening of a movie. Been there, did that for the uh, what was notionally the last Star Wars movies back in uh, Revenge of the Sith. Been to midnight screenings as well, because perishability. So, it's a customer-driven thing. Now, flip side is you say that the firm can prepare in advance for known quantity. If you have sold 200 tickets, no more than 200, uh, only 200 people can access the venue this day, then yes, you can set up your, you can bring in the requisite amount of supplies, you can ensure that you have capacity for 200. You still have the risk of sub 200 attending, of people getting their ticket and then not going. Uh, we see that a lot around uh, the high-end luxury sports where you know, the grand finals for the football, there are empty spaces in the corporate hospitality boxes. People have paid money for the access and the exclusivity and not used it for whatever reason. Their choice, their object. To embrace perishability, though, would be to decide that once it runs out, that you will open at 9 o'clock in the morning, and when you sell out, you will close. And if you sell out 10 minutes after the hour, then you've got the whole of the day to prepare for tomorrow. Uh, embracing perishability means creating exclusivity. So the final aspect to uh, the perishability is the idea of trying to move uh, demand. We'll see this in distribution. We'll see this around queuing strategies. There's a lot of good stuff that we do and we have researched here to see how will systems work. How can we get a sense of either exclusivity or access? And that is the embrace or mitigate. If you're embracing perishability, you're creating exclusivity. For one night only, one time only, limited edition, last concerts, must end, tour cannot be extended, etc. All sorts of perishability aspects that drive demand. We also will deal with some things when we get down to product uh, around using secondary uh, and say, complementary services. So if you take something like the theme park where you're going to be queuing for 50 minutes, using the queuing period to either on sell you something or give you a service experience during the queuing so that you're reducing the perceived wait time. If people are busy whilst they're waiting, people do not realize that they are waiting. Functionally, if you're sitting around the place and you've got time to think and you're bored, you know that you're waiting. If you are doing something during that period, then you're engaged in the service. You're not actually waiting, you're consuming. Uh, the final thing out of this, the take-home exercise for this week. It's the first of the really complicated ones. Freely admit this. I want you to cross the streams. I want you to take the five aspects of the seduction model and say, for each of these five aspects, what does embracing the IHIP model do? What do I create? What, how does it change something? And it's basically building up a bit of a scenario here. So if you're taking intangibility, and I'll put a first example here, the more you embrace the intangibility, what does that do to systems and processes? Well, it reduces the amount of uh, objects that you need in your system, it reduces inventory requirements, but it creates challenges in replication, so your systems need to be flexible to capture information. What does it do for ServiceScape? Specifically, uh, if it's a really heavily intangible Ervis, you may want to use a highly tangible service scape to host it so that the experiential other factors, so an escape room is the value is getting out faster than the time limit you paid for. The service scape will communicate a lot of the experience. So it's a very intangible experience, but the service scape needs to be very evocative to create that Element. So embracing the tangibility requires the service scape to be much more effective. So this is, again, about seeing how ideas cross over and work together. 
I know it's early in semester and I know this is the first time I'm getting you to do one of these exercises, so I want you to fail faster. I want you to try it. If it works, embrace it. If it fails, also embrace that. Same for the mitigation side. What would we do to reduce intangibility, heterogeneity, inseparability, and perishability? On a value offer, on a system, on a service scape, on the contact personnel, on the other customers. What do we do and how do we do it? Here, you can just work out anyway, or you can take a product. You can start doing this as a case of, well, if I was thinking about live music, if I was thinking about the uh, Smith's bookstore, alternate bookstore, and their live events, how would I mitigate these aspects? How would I embrace these aspects? So you can start thinking about it around, because you are going to do stuff around a product offer for me for your assignments. You can start trying to embrace some of the thinking around this now. But that's your task for, that's your take home off the lecture and off the week. Play with the theory, see how the wires interconnect, interweave things, and try it out, see what happens next.